Science on Surfaces. Hello there and welcome to Science on Surfaces, Tips, Tricks and Tools. I'm Marlene Edvardsson. In this podcast, we want to share knowledge and inspiration related to life and science with the ambition to help facilitate work progression and simplify everyday life in the lab. In this episode, we will talk about data analysis and what to do with all that data that you have collected. So here with me in this call, I have Professor Marina Axelsson Fisk, Professor in Mathematical Statistics at Chalmers University of Technology. Welcome, Marina. Thank you. I should actually say welcome back because we had the honor of having you as a guest in episode 28. Then we talked about the uh, design of experiments and that was a very educational conversation. So I would really recommend to those of you who didn't uh, listen to that one yet to listen to episode 28 on design of experiments. Uh, so uh, your research focus is on stochastic models and algorithms for comparative genomics and cross-species gene finding. Yeah, and uh, I'm so pleased that you had the uh, possibility to join us for another conversation here uh, to uh, share some of your knowledge on this very vast topic of uh, data analysis. So very much looking forward to this conversation. Uh, so, data and data collection is really a key part of science. Uh, and uh, in order to learn anything, of course, you have to analyze the data that you have collected. And sometimes the analysis can actually be the, the hardest part. So you collect the data fairly swiftly and then the data analysis takes forever. Uh, so, of course, you want to be you know, efficient and, and uh, have a good... Um, how do you say, like routine on how to analyze your data. So I'm hoping that we can provide some guidance here today. Uh, so, okay, so you want to learn something or understand something about the system under study, say. And uh, so say that you have identified a set of questions uh, that you would like to answer and you've figured out what kind of data that you need to answer these uh, questions. Uh, you've collected the data and now what? What will be the next step once you have the data? Well, yes, now I hope you have listened to the design of experiments pod or, or have, uh, have extracted that information from somewhere else because uh, typically you, you should have uh, decided before you even started to collect your data exactly what you're going to do with it. But um, yes, so depending on what what type of research question you have and what type of data you have. There are a wide variety of, of methods and approaches to, to, to use. Uh, and so this you should have known beforehand then what, what, yeah, what the types are and what, what the types of question you want to answer. So um, where to begin? Uh, there are uh, different types of data you have you can roughly divide it into quantitative and qualitative data. Uh, and in natural sciences and physics, of course, most, most of them are probably quantitative, where you have measurements, you have actual real numbers uh, that are, are um, measuring some, some process or phenomenon or variable. Uh, and there, then you have a wide range of anal analysis methods to deal with that. Uh, but you may also in other fields have qualitative data where it might be survey answers or or it can be text. Um, uh, yeah, you, you're analyzing text for, for domain uh, uh, analysis or such. So you don't have numbers or mm -hmm. measurements or Sometimes uh, these uh, the data are coded as numbers, but typically they're just uh, um, just a, a label. Uh, so your data is labeled by by text or words. Or so, so could you give an an example of that, just to give an idea of? What yeah. So, for instance, if you're answering a survey where you are uh, asked to agree with a certain how much. Uh, do you agree with a certain statement? And then you answer, I 
disagree completely, I disagree somewhat and so on. Mm. And then you have, have a range of uh, answers and, and they are not quantitative, they are not numbers. It's very common to put numbers, maybe you have five options and then you put numbers one to five and that is fine as long as you don't think that they are actually correctly represented as one to five mm. because in, in the, the example I gave, you do have an order between the answers. There, there is a hier hierarchy, so good, better, best, there is an order. But uh, the distance between good and better and from better to best are not necessarily the same for you and they're necessarily not the same for you and me. So even you, if you have equidistance between your answers, I might not and so on. So we can only treat them as in this case that there is an order uh, so best is always best but but uh, you cannot uh, do averages and you cannot do t-tests and you cannot do uh, that type of analysis you have to use other methods but there are many other methods to use depending on what you want to want to do mm -hmm. so that's okay. the first thing yeah mm -hmm. yeah so so for the quantitative then then you always have you will have numbers to work with yeah and then there are different approaches which you should have thought of beforehand but still what different approaches are there uh, yeah so um, um, yeah there you can also divide it roughly into various areas so uh, one first step you might want to do especially if you're new to the field or you're doing so so you, yeah i should say that also you can do exploratory analysis or explanatory analysis it, it's also one division of what types of analysis if you have a research question you have a hy hypothesis that you want to test then you do an explanatory analysis where you where you try to prove or disprove uh, your original thoughts but if you're new to the area and you want to learn about something or learn more about the process you may, may not know what what the relationships are or what uh, research questions to ask so you want to find patterns and then you do an exploratory analysis so you collect data quite uh, uh, without any uh, I can't find the word but but you collect data quite uh, abstractly and try to find various patterns mm. in order to formulate uh, these research questions. Uh, and then I should just make that important note that if you do that and you formulate the research questions, it's very important that you don't do the explanatory analysis on the same data set because uh, the patterns you have found might be true for the for the full population or for the for in reality but it might also be uh, an uh, yeah a random pattern in this specific sample that you have so in order to prove that hypothesis you need to draw a new independent data set and do your explanatory analysis on that simply because you might think you approved something that actually wasn't true and that's something we want to avoid i hope mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so the explanatory analysis, that's when you're sort of proving a, a hypothesis that you may have. Yeah, so, so exactly, testing hypothesis uh, or drawing up relationships, uh, yeah, extracting information. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. so it's more drawing conclusions from, from your data. Mm -hmm. But then, then, then you can do all kinds, a, a wide variety of things here, you can a descriptive analysis is one area where you simply just visualize your data in various ways. You're, you're typically you're drawing graphs or yeah, different graphs or diagrams, but you also may compute like averages and variances and tendencies in various ways. So you get an overview or a compact summary of your data. And this is uh, not conclusive, of course. You don't, you don't uh, uh, prove a hypothesis in descriptive analysis, but it, it, it's extremely useful 
both for you and your potential audience to to illustrate what is going on. So it's always and it's also also a good way to find problems or errors or studying um, the graphical representations of data are often very useful. Mm -hmm. Is this a situation where you would have, you could uh, identify trends or something like that as well, or maybe just illustrate trends there or something? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is something you, you would do in exploratory analysis as well, or maybe more so to find patterns and illustrate trends. And, mm -hmm. But then also when you present your explanatory results, it's also good to have visualizations for the reader to to understand uh, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then you have the next step, which is then inferential analysis, where you infer uh, conclusions from your data. And then you have uh, all kinds of, uh, like I said, uh, statistical methods and hypothesis tests and so on. Um, and here you have, there are many, many methods, but uh, there are also, it's also very important to, to know what the requirements for each method uh, are, because typically there are conditions on each method that has to be fulfilled in order to, to use that method. The data might ha have to be, the data sample has to be independent observations or uh, the errors should be normally distributed and so on. And you need to make sure that these conditions are met uh, because otherwise the, you cannot trust the me uh, results of the method. But you should also know that if these conditions are not met, it's, there are often ways to, to transform your data to make them meet the conditions or there are other methods to use with other conditions or less strict conditions. So, yeah. And there, what methods would you have uh, in this category of the inferential analysis? Or inf you said inferential analysis, right? Yeah. Mm? Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so that, that was an... Uh, uh, exactly. So there, there are other, uh, like predictive analysis, maybe. There is overlaps between these uh, categorizations, of course, but you also have predict predictive analysis. You draw conclusions from his historical data set and make predictions for the future or for, for a new data set. Uh, and you can also look for uh, causality in relationships. You, you look for uh, correlations, relations between variables, and then you want to know who is dependent on who, or what's the direction of the the dependency. Uh, but so if we go back to, now <laughs> I feel like I'm reading from an encyclopedia here. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 it's really good. It's really good. But so it, it, oh. Very common thing in red. It, could you just, I think you moved your microphone there a bit. It's, it's, um, okay. So, yeah, sorry, great. So, yeah, yeah, it's better. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, um, the, the most common uh, thing to do in inferential uh, analysis is to to test uh, types of hypotheses. You wanna you wanna test uh, or you wanna compare two uh, populations with each other. So you you draw a sample from each and then you you test if there is a difference between them, or or you can have more than three two populations. Then you have a, an ANOVA or analysis of variance test, for instance. Or you want to test relationships, so you might do a computer correlation uh, between variables, or if you have a causal relationship where you have one variable depending on another, you can do regression, which is which is like a correlation, but where you actually have have the uh, direction of the dependency. Uh, and yeah, if you have time dependencies, you have longitudinal data that you have measured over time. For instance, I had a master thesis working on uh, uh, pollution uh, in the air from cars. Uh, then they had a, they have, have various measurement stations 
in Gothenburg that measure every 10 second or something like that. And then you have time dependencies, meaning that the measurement of one instance depends on the value of the previous. If you have a value 10 seconds before, it's more likely to be high this time again and so on. Mm -hmm. And then you have to take that into account. And then we have something called time series, which is like a, a linear relationship similar to regression, but where you are looking for trends over time and where you take uh, take into account that you have dependencies between measurements. Uh, yeah, so there are many different types of hypothesis tests for, for testing various uh, values or averages of a sample uh, towards something else, some other population or some other. Yeah, <laughs> but then you have other many other statistical methods as well. Uh, for instance, uh, if you want to do uh, classification, you want to. You want to predict uh, the membership of whatever some group to a certain uh, certain uh, set of classes that that's not really uh, hypothesis testing that's something else but it's still it's still it, it's very common especially in machine learning and then you have a wide range of uh, analysis methods to use for that and you want to if you want to do survival analysis to see how that's, that sounds kind of morbid, but survival might not necessarily mean that someone dies in the end, even though that's where the word comes from. But it, it might be a process that stops or, or for how long something works or so on. And you can analyze for how long uh, a, 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 co a component will, will last, stuff like that. So how would, you do, how would you do that? What kind of input would you need for such an analysis? Uh, now you're <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe that's beyond the scope of this conversation. Yeah, that, that's not my uh, yeah. specific area of expertise. But no. uh, but for instance, uh, you a, a common use of survival analysis is in in medicine and medical care, where you want to see how 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 long uh, it, it can be how long it takes till a patient gets uh, well. Uh, so it does the sur survival, the death in this mm -hmm. case is actually the that they go back to health. So they mm -hmm. leave the they leave the the study and so on. But so so then you have the input is a number of measurements on the patients and and effects of the medicine and the progress. So it's also uh, over time, so it's a longitudinal study, but where the aim is a little bit different than in time series. Time series, you want to see trends and patterns and over over seasons, for instance, while in survival analysis, you want to see the length uh, or for how long someone survives w when you use the word survive in a very abstract way. Mm. So you're mentioning this. Uh, the concept longitudinal study. Is there like a lateral study? Uh, no, so, uh, no, so uh, oh, no, I don't remember the word. So, um, you no, you don't call it lateral, it, but, but, but yes, <laughs> that is another word for it where you, where you're instead of looking over time, you're, you're making just this instant, you're making measurements in at one one specific instance, so mm -hmm. so so then you don't have the time time dependency. But I lost the word now for what it's called when it's not. But yeah, there yeah. is there is a lateral. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. It's called something else. It's called yeah. something else. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think I also have here in my list. You know, I I identified a few different methods, and I I found something called prescriptive. Analysis. I don't think we mentioned that. Maybe we did. Pre yeah. So yeah, you can. True. You can uh, divide the types of data analysis in many different ways, and uh, uh, if you search for it, I think you can find some divides it into four or five, and some divides it into ten. And prescriptive analysis, I would would uh, without knowing exactly what they mean by that mean. 
it, it sounds like that's more in decision making where you where you do an analysis and then you uh, suggest uh, what action to, to take or you prescribe the actions to take. So that's a large field too, decision making uh, to use data for for uh, for making decisions. Mm. Yeah. OK, I mean, so there are so many different ways then to analyze your data. So how how do you go about deciding which approach to use? Yes, yeah, so actually it, it's difficult to list all the ways it, it, like this because there are so many, but once you have your research question defined, it, it's it's not that that difficult. It's not that many things to choose from. If you do experimental data and you want to see, for instance, I'm going back to medical care here. If you want to see that uh, medicine has effect, then you do a, then it's an hypothesis test. Uh, either, either a pair, uh, two, uh, two sample T test or if you have several groups, it's an analysis of variants. Uh, while if you if you want to classify something, then 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 there is also a, a set of methods or still quite wide in that respect. If you want to do classification, it's a jungle, but it's it's more um, competition with met methods use I I method is best. But um, yeah, so that's a not a very clear answer, but. Mm. Uh, <laughs> No, but still, it's still. I, I think so. <clears throat> Once you know what question you're asking and what you're after, um, it's fairly straightforward to know which method to choose because there aren't that many methods that will help you. No, so questions. if, if, if yeah. experimental data, it's very, very, very common that you do some type of hypothesis test, and then there it's more, more about what the different tests require from your from your, your data, as you said, as I said, mm -hmm. which which method you can use. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you have your t-tests or uh, ANOVA tests there, or regression maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we also have uh, um, one category or type of data analysis, or whatever you would call it, which is modeling. Could you say a few words on that? Yeah, that's my f favorite area. <laughs> Aha, it is, okay. Yeah, no, but I do stochastic models, so. Yes, but so all all of this is is modeling really. If if you want to test something or if you want to infer something, you and you have data, you have to. For instance, if you want to infer a re relationship between variables, you have to have to describe uh, the re relationship first mathematically, and that is modeling. So you have to have a model. Uh, very common you assume a linear model that you have a linear dependency between two variables the, like in regression you can draw a straight line um, and uh, and then you can test if if there is uh, an effect of various things but of course the, the, a model is um, it, it's a simplification of reality so it's it's an approximation you can never have uh, the complete uh, relationship in reality is, uh, and also as such it can be wrong and then then your results will not be uh, reliable either uh, but then again you can you can lean back to um, this descriptive analysis to see does the relationship se seem to be linear or maybe you should use some other method and so on but uh, so it's it's um, it's a simplification uh, of the reality, and, but at the same time, a very exact description of what relationship you want to test, for instance, uh, in order to actually test it. Mm. So how, how can you know that you've included everything that you need to include if it's a simplification? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a good question. And that, that is uh, the main issue, I would say. Uh, this is something that you also need to consider in your uh, experimental design. If you want to test the relationship between two variables, you need to make careful, ca careful thought of 
what other variables might be in there and that, that there might be variables affecting your output that you already know about but you're not interested in but then you have to have to to handle them maybe you have to include them in your model still just to make sure that you if you see an effect of something if you see a, a relationship want to know whether it is the relationship you are looking for or if it depends on something else. So you need to make care, t take a close care uh, of or, and think about what, what other uh, variables might be in there. But of course you cannot always account for everything. So then for instance in regression analysis there is something called, um, <laughs> oh no I'm losing the words again. <laughs> Yes, so, oh gosh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting old. No, 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 we, we look it up and then we add it to the show notes afterwards. Yeah, yeah, so, so then, mm -hmm. then um, the residuals, there mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. So, so some, this is an entity called the residuals, which is typically, which is basically the difference between uh, what you have expected to see in your model, if you have this regression and a straight line, and you have your x value, it's the value on the regression line minus the actually observed value because your data will, if if the relationship is linear, if the relationship is, is the one you think, it might not be that the, the measurement points is, is exactly on the line still, it, it will be some variation. So the re residuals is the distance between the measured value and the model value and then you can analyze the residuals in various ways to see, for instance, if the if the model conditions are met, if the linear relationship seems to be correct, and so on. So you can you can analyze the variation of your data to to get a get an idea if your model seems to be okay still. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so. Actually, this uh, this relates to, I guess, uh, assessing the uh, the result or output of the data analysis in general, uh, if the result makes sense and so on. So, I mean, how do you go about that? Is can you always use this residual analysis method or, or some something equivalent, or how do you go about assessing the result? Yes, um, that depends again on what you want to do. If if it is a regression you're doing, then then the residuals, uh, the, the residuals can tell you if your model assumptions seem to be correct. But uh, assessment is um, is a larger concept where you both uh, you both need to assess the the method you're using or the model you're using, but also the quality of your data because you might have measurement methods that are are bad, uh, for instance. So you need to, so assessment can be both about testing whether your, or, or checking whether your method seems to be working. Uh, if you're developing, developing algorithms or like in artificial intelligence or machine learning in general, uh, this is a big thing that you need to check if your if your model is actually a good fit to your data. Uh, but you can also need to assess the, the accuracy of your measurements. Uh, that didn't answer you how, how to go about it. But to, <laughs> when you, for instance, when you're developing an algorithm, what you want to do is that you want to have have a you want to have, a, if, if, if possible, you want to have a, a set of data where you know what the real answer is. For instance, if you're doing classification, you will have a data set where you actually know the actual class labels. And then you predict the class labels with your method. And then you, you get a measurement of how accurate your method is. And that will help you in, in improving the model and developing the, the model further. Um, mm -hmm. Because uh, I'm thinking, what was I, I was going to ask you a follow-up question on that. Yeah, um, I mean, there are so many things that you've mentioned now 
in relation to assessing you know the output but because you, you also have the quality of the data input so you have the quality of the data the data that you've measured or collected then you have the the model maybe or what the method that you're using and then you know what comes out and so there it seems like there's so many opportunities for things to go wrong <laughs> or <laughs> things can go wrong in so many different places and i'm just thinking i mean how how can you make sure that what you're doing is you know reasonable or correct or valid uh, I mean, starting with the data input, what, what should you do there? Can you do an assessment already there? Maybe you... Because if you measured something that doesn't make sense from the start, I mean, I guess, I don't know. Do you see what I'm after? Yeah, so again, if we're beginning with a measurement, then... Yeah, uh, I don't know how hard this is it varies but but you should try to to make measurements you you you, you sh should try to uh, calib calibrate your method so that you you measure uh, something where where it's perfect in a sense that you you measure you know like if you have a thermometer measuring the temperature you should, uh, if possible, have have something where you actually know the temperature as close as possible, and then you would measure uh, on that, and then you see see the uh, difference in accuracy. So that's one way you should c calibrate your methods. Um, and you can also, if that's not possible, you can compare different methods and see how they differ uh, to see if there are tendencies uh, and so on uh, but the, yeah it's a diff difficult question mm -hmm. uh, how to how to uh, make sure that your input data is accurate mm -hmm. but you sh you should absolutely be very careful with your data so there is a is an important step step of data validation and data cleaning where you should uh, make sure that uh, the data makes sense so that if you have outliers you have to investigate them and that's very important not to just remove them because they may be true and then you will obscure your results if you remove them but on the other hand if they are wrong if they're due to some error you should definitely remove them because otherwise they will also obscure, obscure your results so you have to be very careful with how you deal with outliers and not just remove them blindly or, or leave them in blindly because both are wrong. And sometimes it's very obvious if you if you have a, a data set that someone else put in and you have have an age group where, where someone is 250 years old, you you should remove that outlier mm -hmm. <laughs> or or look into if you can find the uh, find the correct data point there because it, Another step is when you actually have your data in one form and then you maybe sit and type on your computer. It's very, very common, unfortunately, that you type, make mistakes in typing. Uh, so one remedy there that I teach my student is type it in twice. Oh. And if you if you have difference somewhere, then you should check one extra time. Yeah. Yeah. That's so a that, good one. Yeah. 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 They don't like it because that's <laughs> extra work. But that's one way to make sure uh, that you you or or at least eliminate some some errors like that. Mm. Yeah. So before you move on to doing the analysis, you should do a data validation and a data cleaning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And uh -huh. also, you know. There's so much data. If you're if you have collected data yourself, or you're given it, you you might have a lot of. You get this. I have, have data sets where I get an Excel sheet of thousands of variables, and I am only interested in three. Then you should just remove the others. You just keep what what's correct to you, or or important to you, uh, and so on. Uh, so yeah. Reduce mm -hmm. your data is, is also part of, of the process if, if it's you get more data than you need. Mm -hmm. um, you've mentioned uh, error 
uh, and so on. And there, there are a few concepts or terms that I know people are confused about related to this, and that's precision and accuracy related to the error. Uh, could you say a few words about those? What they are, what is the difference and how to relate to them? Yes, so there is unfortunately very good reason for the confusion because in experimental sciences precision and accuracy are different and I'll explain the difference. But in machine learning precision or typically precision and recall are measures of accuracy. So in mm -hmm. machine learning precision and is a, a type of accuracy measure. While in experimental data precision, precision relates to the precision of your measurement methods, how exact your measurement values are, while accuracy is how correct your model is. Mm -hmm. So, so they're both um, both uh, dealing with accuracy, but but uh, precision is is, uh, for instance, if your measurement method is rounded off or or if it's noisy or or not so not so uh, exact, uh, that's uh, pre precision. How precise? How many decimal points you can rely on in the output? While in uh, accuracy, then you're evaluating the model. How good the model fits the data. So that's the main this problem. But while in machine learning, precision and recall are these type one and type two errors in hypothesis testing, if that makes sense. It, you're, both of them are then evaluating the model accuracy, but uh, one evaluates if you're, for, for instance, um, classifying something uh, and you have a set of known classes, then let me see if I remember which is which here. <laughs> uh, one is how many of the actual, uh, uh, how many uh, correct classifications you actually did. Uh, and uh, for instance, if you're classifying into classes A and B, how many of the A classes did you actually capture with your method? And the other is how many of your pred predicted A classes were actually true? So there are percentages of either it's a percentage of the true data set and then the other is the percentage of your prediction. Uh, and these two unfortunately operates opposite each other exactly like the type one and type two errors. So uh, if you try to boost your precision, then you the recall will will drop. And if you boost the recall, then you so, so because if you if you if you um, if you predict everything as class A, then your recall will be will be perfect. And if you predict nothing as A, then your precision will be perfect. Uh, so you want to want to have a good uh, trade off between the two. But so th that's why the confusion surrounding the word precision has has come about, I think. Yeah, it means different things. Mm. That is confusing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, also, let's see, I had a few other concepts that I wanted to talk about. But first, uh, could you say something about reproducibility? Is that something that you also think about, I guess? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, very important. I mean, how can you, yeah, so how, how can you tell if your data is reproducible? Yes, how can you tell? The practical uh, application are always harder than the <laughs> definition. <laughs> but so you you have you have various steps here. You have, if you have an experiment, you have repeatability. That means that you can you can you repeat your own uh, measurements in the same environment. So it's the same same research group, same setup basically. And then you have. Re uh, um, replicability, which means that a different research group in another lab should be able to, to get, get the same results in if they use the same, same setup, same setup, but different teams. 
And then the third step is repro reproducibility, where you have a different team and a different setup. Uh, if if you're actually if you actually measure something that is a, something that is real in nature, uh, then it should be possible for someone else to to prove the same thing with a similar set setup. Of course, you don't you cannot do you have to use the same model and the same hy hypothesis, but you don't have to have the exact same setup, perhaps. So uh, this is this is to ensure again uh, that what your the findings you have are real, uh, so that it's not again just a. Uh, 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 an unf unfortunate uh, uh, pattern uh, due to something else or due to the specific setup or the specific uh, researcher and also a way to avoid this um, uh, other word confirmation bias, which is another <laughs> term uh, that you you pull yourself to see what you're looking for. Uh, human beings are very good at finding patterns but we're also very biased in our ways so if i expect to see a pattern then i'm more likely to find that than and i'm more likely to ignore uh, contradictory evidence so re reproducibility to require that is to make sure that uh, all such biases are removed um, but exactly how to go about to make sure that that happens. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert on how to do that. <laughs> but you have to be uh, be very skeptical to everything you do. Try to be the devil's advocate in everything you do and try to try to disprove your own hypothesis, uh, for instance, and then you might might actually find problems and errors mm. more easily. Mm. Uh, yeah, there are so many different terms related to data analysis. Um, I was thinking that maybe we could just cover a few of, of them uh, that we haven't mentioned. Um, one, uh, uh, one term that I know people are also confused about uh, is the chi-square test. Uh, we get a lot of questions about that, uh, what that is and how to use it. Uh. Yes, um, so the chi-square test is, uh, it has several uses actually. Um, for instance, the uh, most common maybe is, uh, is uh, uh, goodness of fit it, it, it test. It, it, uh, you can... Uh, infer independence or dependence between variables by doing a goodness of fit test and what you're doing then typically what a chi-square test does is that it has you have some observations observed data and then depending on your hypothesis or your model you have expected values again like in the, the regression you would expect the measurement to lie on the a straight line and then then you take the squared difference <laughs> of these distances and, and you analyze it uh, so that's why it's the chi square because it's square differences mm. so square of the residuals yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. exactly for instance uh, and and you can also use it to comp to if you, you if you're assuming um, like you we, teaching in marine biology uh, if you want to see if uh, there is a, a clumping of a species like like uh, snails on the beach if they tend to prefer one area over another then you would the null hypothesis in hypothesis testing is always to to assume no dependency or no relation or nothing 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 is going on is the null hypothesis so in that in in this respect, the, the snails would be randomly distributed and evenly distributed with variation, of course. So then you would compare your, your if you divide your, this beach into smaller squares, say, and you count how many snails are in each, then you would have your observed 
value in each square, and then you would have your expected value, which would be some average of the total population. Or in, in if you want to be specific, you would compare your values to a Poisson distribution, which is if it's uh, something in in um, spe spatially distributed uh, randomly will follow a Poisson distribution. So then you would compare your observed values to what's expected in the Poisson distribution, and then you take the square differences, and then you have your chi-square uh, uh, statistic. And what, so, so, so what you see there is if your model is correct or if your assumption is correct, these differences will be very small and the square differences will be a little bit bigger, of course, but, but uh, the sum of the square distances will be very small. While if, if, if your model is wrong or if your assumption is wrong or if in this case uh, the snails are not randomly distributed, you will get a large value of, of your chi-square statistic. And if it's large enough in some uh, probability se sense, then, then you will reject your model or your hypothesis. So why would you want to take the square of the residuals and not just the sum of you know, the residuals? Like the sum of the square of the residuals and not just the sum uh, of the residuals. Because you, you want to, you, first of all, you want to well, the practical answer is that you you don't care if it's it's smaller or bigger. You, if you take uh, the sum, you will have negative values uh, cancel out positive values when you actually have two deviations. So you want you only interested in the size of the deviation, mm -hmm. and the more uh, uh, and the more theoretical answer is that this gets a distribution that we <laughs> can understand, and that's something I try to teach my students as well. Each each hypothesis test has its own specific statistic. It is it, some some quantity you have to compute, uh, and well, these days we use computers, so they don't have to care. But when we had tables before, you had to compute it, and and it wasn't the average only. You, you take the average minus the mean value divided by the standard deviation, stuff like that. It's a often very a complex uh, variable, and the answer is. We have to transform our data to something that has a distribution that we know. We need to transform it into a normal distribution, or in this case, the chi-square chi distribution is actually the square of two, uh, the, the square of a normal distribution. So it's a distribution that we know how it behaves. So we transform our data into a, a shape that we can compute probabilities of. So that's the mm -hmm. complex answer. But but uh, more practical, you want the deviation, the size of the de deviation, not the direction of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a few more terms. Uh, the confidence interval. What's that? Yeah. So, uh, for instance, if you want to estimate the value of some characteristic in a population, you want to estimate the average height in uh, a school or, or in Sweden or, or women, whatever, uh, then you take the average and that's one value, but it only only tells you the center of the distribution. It doesn't tell you how, how big the variation is uh, because, uh, for instance, the, the height would be a normally distributed variable. So, and, but that can have many shapes. It can be, it has the bell shape, but it can be very wide or it can, can be very narrow. So in order to, to give you uh, an idea of how, again, how precise, maybe is a word for it, uh, your, your estimate of the mean value is, you give, uh, uh, it, it's like giving a marginals, uh, error bar. So the confidence, uh, confidence interval tells you how big the variation is. So while you have the average, this is the expected or the estimated center of the distribution. The confidence level tells you, for instance, we we believe that 95% of the population is within this interval. So it gives you a little bit more information that also gives you a hint of how big the variation is. 
Mm. And you mentioned confidence level as well. Uh, so the confidence level, how does that relate to the interval? Yeah, so you have to, you would, of course, you would like to say I'm 100% sure that uh, the the way uh, the weight is within within this interval, but or, or you want to uh, say I'm 100% sure that uh, that uh, the mean value, the average, is within this interval, but it's impossible to get 100%. So you have to you have to because you typically compute your average from a sample which is small which is a small subset of the population and even though it's drawn randomly and you have taken good care in sampling a, and making the sample representative there will still be variations so if you do the same thing again and draw a new sample you will get a new average so you will have a a distribution there and you cannot be 100% sure because then you would have to sample the entire population so in order to not having to do that, uh, you have to accept some errors. So, so do you set your confidence level and it's the, it's the other side of the coin as in hypothesis test where you have a significance level, how significant your result is. So if you have a 95% confidence interval, meaning that the confidence level is 95%, you are saying that you are 95% certain in some some way that the true average is within this interval, which means that there is a 5% chance that 5% of, of the, if you did this uh, repeatedly, draw a hundred samples, then about uh, five of those hundred samples will have average averages outside this confidence interval. So you, you will make an error. And then depending on how how certain you need to be and how much data you have and so on you can you can choose various uh, sizes of the confidence level the higher the confidence level the the more accurate more certain you are but then then you need need to either have a much larger data set or the variation in the population has to be small so again, the trade-off of how much data you need and how certain you need to be. Okay, I see. And then we talked about reliability in some ways, I guess, but I think maybe I uh, that was related to, uh, I guess, just the whole process you had the the instruments that you collect the data with and so on uh, so maybe that's uh, that would be relevant throughout the, the entire data collection and analysis and uh, to achieve reprodu reproducibility sort of I guess um, yeah so the, it can it can be it's probably probably related to the measurement method. So if you, that's one other way to calibrate your measurements or your, your measurement method, that if you measure the uh, several times on the same thing, it should give you the same value, but uh, it might be varying in the, in, again, if you have a thermometer and you have a exact uh, temperature, and if you measure with some intervals with the same method and you get different values you will uh, you will also see how reliable your method is mm -hmm. okay so what are then the main challenges when you analyze data you would say yes what are the main challenges <laughs> seems like there are quite many challenges <laughs> Yes, I think this thing I, I mentioned before, confirmation bias is a very important uh, uh, challenge. Uh, it's a pitfall that you you are looking for something, you're searching for a specific pattern, uh, and you you we we tend to to see what we want to see and uh, ignore what we don't don't uh, want uh, don't expect. Uh, so this this happens a lot, and it happens. It's not it's not a fraud. It's not cheating. It, 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 the intent is not to cheat. It's it's just uh, we we fool ourselves. So 
one remedy is to to try to prove the opposite, try to disprove your your hypothesis and try to find other explanations and try to be as skeptical as possible to to make sure that the relationship you're seeing is actually the true relationship. If you see a correlation, are the two these two variables actually correlated or are they perhaps related to a third third variable uh, that, so that they vary at the same time? For instance, one, one could say that most people that die have gray hair, so being having gray hair is dangerous. Uh, and there, there's a correlation that uh, they, they tend to depend on the same thing, <laughs> but mm. it's not not the, the, the direct relationship between the two. Mm. Uh, so be very skeptical. That's that's difficult, but it's very important, mm. and and might actually lead to new conclusions that were unexpected and may be even better. So it might be worth it. <laughs> mm. So confirmation bias, that's one pitfall to look out for. Are there any others? Any other? Yeah, so then there is uh, something called survival bias. Uh, uh, that maybe relates more to when you do surveys or when you do uh, longitudinal analysis over patients in a medical care. Uh, or, or for instance, when you're when people are allowed to volunteer to participate in a study, uh, you, you analyze only the data you have or the data that made it all the way through to the end. Uh, but there might be data points that fell out or patients that dropped out or or uh, uh, the people that joined the uh, survey. Uh, might be biased because they have have an interest in this, while those that chose not to come. Uh, so, so you have to consider if if you're missing some important range uh, or important uh, part of the population uh, when you're collecting your data. So, uh, and it, it it may be difficult to find out, and it may be difficult to figure out if that's the case, but it's important to keep in mind, uh, depending on what you're doing, that uh, the data you collected might not be as representative as you would want it to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, any other challenge related to this? Yeah, this thing with uh, outliers, of course, whether to include them or remove them. It's very important to try to do your very best to figure out if an outlier can be uh, uh, explained as a as a as an error or if it's actually possible that it is showing something real. And also keep in mind that many big uh, findings were due to outliers <laughs> where the researchers at the first sight like uh, what's that in English? Oh. This super, <laughs> yeah, uh, the, yeah. Mm. yeah. They, uh, the story says that they were found through a, through a, an outlier. The, the research group were measuring the conductance of, of some, something, and they got these measures that were, was out of way out of the chart. And this was right before Christmas, so they said, "Ah, oh, forget it. We go go for a Christmas break and do it again after." And then they came back and they they got the same results. And suddenly they had found something new. So that's that's one story of yeah. where. Yeah. So outliers, you have to t make good care because if you remove them when they should be in there, then then again your data is not completely representative and and doesn't uh, mirror the population the way you want to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we have three three important uh, things. We have the confirmation bias. Uh, you said the survival bias, and then take care of the outliers. Uh, are those the three most important ones? Yeah, maybe. And correlation and causality is a common mistake that you see a relationship between variables, and then you th think that one is causing the other, that you see a dependency or a direction of the dependency. Uh, again, like with the uh, gray hair, 
Uh, so to, to uh, be careful not to assume causality just because you see a correlation. Right. That's also. Yeah. Um, okay. Anything else you would like to add? Anything really, really important that we didn't mention so far? This is such a well, vast probably. topic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Important things to add, but uh, it's a, it's I. This is uh, something I really enjoy. Data analysis is fun. Uh, mm. So uh, uh, you should let your curiosity drive you, but don't be too proud to to find mistakes in your own research. Yeah. yeah. No, I yeah. Do, I don't know. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, when we had an earlier conversation about methods and softwares. Uh, also, maybe we should say something about that. But that, mm -hmm. that's easily also to, you can find it on the internet. But because the, the, there's a jungle of methods to use, and again, depending on what you want to do. Uh, but uh, what we see at Chalmers is that Python is is coming strong. It's it's taking over a lot. So you using Python in various formats. For, for instance, in the Anaconda Jupyter Notebook, where you also can use... So Jupyter Notebook is probably a good tool to get acquainted with, because you can use not only Python, but a large range of different uh, programming languages. And Python has a lot of modules coming with it, so it's becoming a powerful uh, analysis tool as well, both in statistics and in machine learning and in other areas. So mm -hmm. that's probably good to learn if you don't know it already. Mm. Great, great comment. So we will add this to the show notes as well. Uh, great. Uh, and I really liked what you said there. Let your curios curiosity guide you. Or was that what you... Yeah. I think uh, that's a very good uh, ambition yeah. in science in general, right? Uh, so I think we will end this episode with that comment. And uh, so thank you so much for sharing some of your knowledge on this very vast topic. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to all of you out there, thanks for listening to this episode with me, Marlin Edvardsson and Madeleine Axelsson Fisk, Chalmers University of Technology. And I would also like to take the opportunity to those of you listening or watching that if you're interested in surface or interface science and related topics, you should check out our blog, the Surface Science blog. Thank you.